Women to Watch is an intimate look into the lives of prominent and influential women leaders from around the world and the challenges they faced on their journey. It's the real story behind her title. Join us every week to hear more stories about women from around the world and in your own communities at womentowatch.net. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. For the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC <laughs> Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another week of Women to Watch. I'm Sue Rocco. I'm so happy to be here this week with um, another truly inspiring story with a woman leader. Joining me in just a moment is going to be the Honorable Judge Carolyn Tornetta Carluccio. Uh, Judge Carluccio is President Judge of the Court of Common Pleas, Montgomery County, and a candidate for the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Um, as always, stay with us during the breaks where you'll hear from our exclusive watch team of corporate partners. And this week, Sherry Morrison for our Lifestyle Watch segment is going to be speaking with Chef Amy Edelman of the Night Kitchen here in Philadelphia. So now I'm very excited and honored to welcome to the show Judge Carluccio. Hi, Susan. It's great to see you. Hi, it's great to have you here. I'm, I'm very um, excited and, and happy that you were able to take the time. Um, I know this is a very busy time for you. And um, you're joining us for the viewers and listeners outside of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. you're, you're joining us from Montgomery County. That's uh, right. It's a western suburb of Philadelphia mm -hmm. on a beautiful day. It is beautiful. It is beautiful. Um, so I'm excited to, to kind of bring the viewers a sense of your background um, and your upbringing and what led you to pursue this type of work. Um, and I know that you grew up in Bluebell. And from, is that right? Not exactly. That is Montgomery <laughs> County. I did grow up outside of Norristown, which oh, is our did. county seat. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, from all of the research I've done, um, a very traditional, um, warm, happy childhood um, that, you know, you spent a lot of time with the family and, and never missed a day of church, as you said. And I wonder how you bring those values to, um, to the work that you're doing today. You know, it's interesting. When I look back on my childhood, I was indeed blessed. Um, my parents, my dad is a first generation Italian American. Um, he has an amazing work ethic. He is the hardest working person that I know. Uh, my mother is a very proud Irish woman. And together they raised us in a home that was literally full of love and family. That was it. I look back and we did. We never missed church. It didn't matter where we were, what we were doing. We always went to church together. Uh, we always had family dinner together. We'd get together with family every chance we, we could. Uh, weekends, as we were growing older and I had my children, was always spent with family. So I find that at the core of who I am, I find that looking back as it established my values, um, it, it gave me a warmth. It gave me a confidence that I'm not sure I would have had without that kind of nurturing support. Um, and I think I bring that into my everyday work that I do now. Um, my father also, another thing that was really prominent in our upbringing was you always did the right thing. And that's a broad concept, but it could be something as simple as if the cashier gave you 25 cents too much, you always brought it back. Um, if you are a, able to, you always get back to your community. You get involved in community endeavors. You volunteer your time. And I knew nothing other than that. And uh, public service has really been my entire career and my life. So I, I'm i curious if having that kind of stable, secure, I think what a family unit like that gives you a sense of security and does lead to confidence. What was it that, was there anything that you struggled with kind of on the inside, you know, that um, you were able to overcome or that is still a challenge for you today? So it, it's interesting to see where I am today and where I started in terms of my, I guess it's my confidence. It's, um, I was very shy. I was the, the child that you'd find hiding behind my mother's leg when people, you know, came to talk to us. I'd scooch around to hide. Um, and I think it was really the influence of my mother's mother, my grandmother, who was 
very dramatic. She was an actress and she taught me from a very young age, we would recite poetry and I won the poetry contest in sixth grade. Uh, for a shy child, that was a big deal. And yeah. then I converted that into a love of acting. I wasn't a superstar, but I loved to do it. And she also taught me that. We grew up doing plays in the backyard and in the side yard. Um, and I converted that into something I did in high school and in college a little bit. Uh, what that was, was the ability to be somebody else. I could be very dramatic. Mm. I could be very out there because it wasn't then Carolyn Carluccio doing it. It was this right. role I was playing. So I found that to be very liberating. And, and probably had um, an influence on your um, trials or, you know, performing mm -hmm. and having to um, defend in, in a courtroom are similar in that you're kind of, I don't want to say performing, but yeah. you are in a sense. And mm -hmm. it's interesting when I talk to women that, you know, as little girls were shy, yeah. the ability to um, pretend to be someone else in any form is is almost similar to that um, that saying about kind of fake it till you make it. So mm -hmm. you're over here performing, but mm -hmm. it's taking away from who you really are. Is that how, how you would describe it? I think what it did really, maybe some of that, but it really just allowed me to maybe be something I was inside and just couldn't let it out. It allowed mm -hmm. me to bring out my inner person or whatever it was that was going on there uh, that I may ordinarily have been a little bit shy to show. And I do think you're right that because of that, my career, I was a litigator. I was a trial attorney. A very small percentage of attorneys are actually in the courtroom trying cases. I know we see it on TV. It looks like everybody's in the courtroom, but really a small percentage do it. Mm -hmm. And my career became a trial attorney. I loved being in the courtroom. I loved the interaction with the jury and uh, with the judge and with the other opponents. I love that interaction to understand a case, to explain the case, to present the case in a certain fashion in order to get the jury to believe my side of the story. How old were you when you made the decision, I'm going to go to law school? Hmm. I think it was always in the back of my mind, at least from a, you know, maybe high school age. My uncle, my mother's brother, uh, was it was a little bit of my hero in a lot of ways. He was younger than my mother. He was a football star at, star at Notre Dame. He was kind of this larger than life, um, good guy. He would babysit for us and real good looking and and very, very influential. Then he became a district attorney in Montgomery, the district attorney in Montgomery County at a very young age. And he got on the bench here at a very young age. So uh, he influenced me a great deal. He was my uncle who became my mentor, who became my colleague. So that was such a nice transition. He is still on the bench with me now. Uh, he is a senior judge, but we were able to serve together as colleagues on this bench. And I have to say that was certainly a highlight wow. of my career in a lot of ways. Yeah. And yeah, he's still amazing. Wonderful. Amazing? Yeah, that's really wonderful. Did, have, did you, as you were coming up the ranks, did you turn to him for advice and you know, um, absolutely. I'd be yeah. silly not to. He, right, right. he is just, he's got the greatest demeanor. He tells a great story. As recently as this morning, I was talking to him about something that I was dealing with and wanted to get his thoughts on it. Um, I rely on him because I trust him. Um, and I think he is the wisest man I know. Wow. So yeah. you were, you were the first, first female president judge, um, in the history of Montgomery County. That's correct. Uh, I'm curious, did you ever, in the, in the beginning then, did you ever experience, you know, what we talk about today is gender mm -hmm. bias? Was there moments where you felt you were getting a little pushback? Or so, did you kind of block, how did you deal with that? Yeah, I have to say, when I first started to practice, although I didn't acknowledge it as such at the time, when you look back, you often realize what was going on. Look, I've never been one to be a victim. I will never be a victim. I will always take the high road and push through because if you tell me I can't do something, that's just the little flame that ignites me to do it and then do it even better. Um, I do recall, I have two things that I kind of remember when I was um, in the U.S. Attorney's Office, when I first got out of school, I was a federal prosecutor, and I was going against a lot of defense attorneys who were coming from D.C. and New York. I was in the District of Delaware doing a lot of drug cases and some mm -hmm. healthcare fraud. And I can remember attorneys coming in from New York and um, 
DC telling me that they thought I was an assistant or I was the secretary or I was the paralegal. Um, nobody ever assumed I was the little girl. I was young, but I looked even younger than I was. Um, they were very patronizing and I never took offense at it because what would happen is I would use that as a strength and I would be very sweet and they'd be very sweet to me and treat me with kit gloves. But then I would surprise them in the courtroom because although mm -hmm. I can be very sweet on the outside, I also know what I'm doing. And um, they don't expect that. So I use that as an advantage. Uh, I can remember one time I was cross-examining a, um, a defendant on the stand. And all of a sudden, the defense attorney got up and he whispered in my ear, it wasn't on the record, that the slit in my skirt was driving him crazy. And at oh the time, God. at the time, I was a little bit flabbergasted. I didn't know how to handle it. And I went on. But in retrospect, what was happening was, I was getting somewhere and he didn't know how to handle that. So this yes. is what his, this is what he did to get me off my game. Um, wow. If I had been on top of it, I might have asked that it be put on the record. I don't know. Um, yeah. But at the time, I, I didn't understand it for what it was. Hmm. Um, and again, I, I'm not a victim. I, I'm going to push ahead and I'm going to be better and stronger for it. Yeah. Wow. That's just amazing to me. That's so, you know, um, <sighs> just ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> so you know you're right. You know that that's helpful too. You you're as someone who is just innately honest and and fair, having all the traits that really a good judge should have. Um I think will always kind of keep hold your conviction and and almost be able to laugh off those kind of comments. Absolutely. Right? Because inside you know what you're doing. Yeah. You know, um you have seen in your work just the worst of the worst mm -hmm. of humanity, um, probably things that, you know, as lay people who don't work mm -hmm. as you do um, in law. And I would like to ask you if you can share something with mm -hmm. us that is a positive take. So having seen the worst of the worst of humanity and in, in dealing with, you know, bank robbers, drug dealers, mm -hmm. you know, money launders, um, can, can you tell us that there's more good people than bad. You know, oh. it's something I share with my kids and I've always believed it, but with the news cycle today, mm -hmm. you can start to wonder. I, I share that concern and you do start to wonder, but I am also a glass half full person. I always look to the best part of everything. And I, this process of being a judge and rising the way I have, I've met so many wonderful people. And the being a judge, I get the opportunity to perform marriages. I get the opportunity mm -hmm. as a judge to um, allow adoptions. We, we do do adoptions, which is also a very happy time. A lot of times in the family division, um, there have been situations where the child is in the middle of parents who are fighting good people, but they fight and they use the child as a weapon. And what I've realized is I have the ability to look at a situation and understand how to help make this family whole. And there are times, not as much as I'd like, but there have been times in that division where I felt as if I've really done a good job, that I've really helped make a family whole. And for me, that's worth everything. It's 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 been uh, you know, a joy, uh, but there are far too many times when I'm not able to do it. And people are so strident in their positions that they're not able. And I think that's a problem we have today more than ever is everybody's so strident that they are right and nobody else is right. Um, and they aren't able to hear reason or common sense. And that's a yeah. frustrating part. Yeah. You know, you mentioned at the top of the show, you are a mother and you have three mm -hmm. sons. I do. And, um, you know, when we talk about just manners and respect and, you know, the things that I would say we grew up with as mm -hmm. a generation, do you think that's missing today? Do you think, you know, when you look at your boys, I'm sure, I'm sure they've been raised beautifully and followed in your footsteps. But do you think it's something that really is missing in society? I have to say, I do think that we need to do a better job at that. My boys, I was always shocked at people that say, oh, they're so polite. Well, I hope that all children are polite. They should all be raised to be polite and be kind and be good. Um, we see when I was working in juvenile court, I remember at one point thinking, are there any good kids out there anymore? It was so hard. Are there any kids that are not subject to abuse and to the, the really underbelly of society? Because there's a lot of them that are. And I learned that, that the, there are good there are good kids out there. And I learned that through working. I teach civics education, the sixth grades in Arstown Area School District for the last 10 years. And I've met so many young kids who maybe don't have the best 
um, in their home environment. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't. But they want to learn. They want to be. They want to be good. Um, and I think that's an exciting piece of what we do. As a judge, we don't. I don't stay hidden in my chambers or on my bench. I'm out in the community. I'm trying to work with getting people to understand what the courts do, what our legal system is all about, bringing them into the courthouse, bringing them into the courtrooms. Um, that's a really important piece of what we do. And I have also seen a, how do you put it, where the disrespect, not just we're talking about children, but lawyers, um, the civility in our courtrooms have has definitely oh, no. decreased. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's also very disheartening. Um, I don't need people to show respect to me because of my position. I need them to show respect for the entire system, for our justice system and the process. And that's starting to flounder. Yeah. And there's, yeah. you know, a grownups are supposed to be the example and we're right. not seeing the best example. So I don't know what the answer to that is yet, but we'll work on it. We're going to go into our first break. Um, and when we come back, of course, I want to ask you what made you decide to run for Supreme Court? Okay. Stay with us and we'll be back with Judge Carolyn Tornetta Carluccio. Stay with us for our watch team. We are CHOP, and we can't wait to show you around. We are the nation's first children's hospital. Now, a care network with more than 50 locations that continues to expand. Three state-of-the-art research buildings with 1.5 million square feet of space. We have grown from 12 beds 165 years ago to nearly 600 beds and one of the best children's hospitals in the world. We have a level one trauma center, 11 floors of patient units, more than 20 operating rooms, first of its kind delivery unit for babies with birth defects, a separate cardiac operative and catheterization suite, and places to learn, like our internationally recognized simulation center, we have trained generations of leaders in the field of pediatrics. We are world leaders in medicine, surgery, and science. One of the top recipients in NIH funding for pediatric research. In this building, pioneers in CAR T therapy, mitochondrial disease, brain tumors, hyperinsulinism, and other rare diseases. Here, groundbreaking work in fetal surgery, genetics and genomics, and neurology. In our newest building, leaders in social determinants of health, clinical informatics and epidemiology, autism, trauma and injury prevention. Our patients come from every state and 115 countries. challenges requires the best and the brightest. We are passionate about pediatrics. We are motivated to make a difference in the world and in our community. We are a team. We are CHOP. stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. And the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the show. I'm joined this week by Judge Carolyn Tornetta Carluccio. Can I say how much I love that name? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> greatest name. Um, I, I wanted to start this segment, um, Judge, by talking about, I think you might have had an epiphany when you were presiding over your first case in family court. 
and you kind of recognized what your career path was and should be. Can you talk about that? You know, when you, I was, I had to run for, to be a judge on this court. That was 14 years ago. And, and it's a process. Being in an election is not easy. And it was countywide. And while you were running, you almost forget about what you're running for, if that sounds crazy. And once I got, and I won, I got on the bench and I thought, oh my goodness, what if I can't make a decision? I listen to one side and I think that's a great argument. That makes a lot of sense. And then you listen to the other side and you say, actually, that's a pretty good argument too. And what happened was they put me in the family division and I had had no experience. I hadn't even taken a class in family law, but I have life experience. And I think that's really important. Um, and I sat up on the bench and all of a sudden it was crystal clear to me how I was going to make this family whole. And I don't know, I joked about it. And so I'm not sure if it's the elevation of the bench or it was the black robe, whatever it was that made it very clear to me. And I was, I loved what I was doing. And every night I'd go home to my husband, I'd say, I love my job. And, and it got to the point where we were saying, all right, already, I get it. You love your job. <laughs> well, I've loved every job I've had in the law. And that's sadly is a little bit rare, um, but I've been blessed with all kinds of interesting jobs that have actually brought me to where I am today. Yeah. I, you know, there's so much discourse though, mm -hmm. you know, again, as a lay person reading about things that are happening within our justice system and, mm -hmm. and, you know, cases in general. Um, and I guess this goes back to your kind of just your courage and conviction. So if, if there's a, a young woman watching or listening and she's contemplating going in, into law, but worries about that neg negative side of it, what would you say to her? You know, I, you follow your passion. If you love something, you're going to be really good at it. And always allow yourself to try something. If it doesn't work, you don't have to stay in it. Um, I, I've always been of the theory that when a door closes, another one opens. And that happened to me several times where you thought you're going down a certain path, but that is not viable for whatever reason. And there's another opportunity there. Walk through that door. You just never know where it's going to bring you. And the negativity, it's noise. That's what it is, this noise. And if you can block out the noise and follow the path that is true to you, you're going to do the right thing and you're going to be good at it. Yeah. Do you ever worry about your safety as a judge and, and you know, aspiring now to go on to the Supreme yeah. Court? Do you think about that? I guess we always think about it, but it is not something I obsess over. I'm very careful about what I do. I had more fear when I was a federal prosecutor. I had a few incidents that scared me, truly scared me. Um, but as a judge, I find that I, I probably should be more aware of it, but I, I don't fear so much. I don't. I do my job. And if I were to fear and be worried, I wouldn't be able to do the job. Correct. That I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Let me ask you this. If you were not in the profession you are, was there a second maybe? Was there something else you, <laughs> you thought you might do in life if you didn't I, go to law school? I hadn't thought about that in that way. I think that I would always have been in some kind of uh, interaction with people. I think I might have been a newscaster or oh. I don't know why that just popped into my head. But uh, I think something that involved interacting with the public in some way oh, and bringing community. information to the public. Yeah. Yes. Um, I want to read a quote. You said, in my courtroom, everyone, regardless of race, class, gender and ethnic background, will be treated fairly, professionally and in accordance with the law. Um, I want to ask you two things. What is your, what are you most proud of in your ability uh, to do as a judge? And then what is the most difficult part of it? So I think I'm most proud of the ability to listen to everybody, no matter how painful it may be sometimes, you know, but you always have to listen and give everybody their day in court. Um, I, I believe, I truly believe in that quote. I truly believe what I wrote, that everybody deserves to be heard and everybody deserves respect, no matter what their position is. So I'm most proud of my ability to maintain my demeanor and give everybody a fair day in court. And the most difficult thing is, I mean, there are certainly times when you listen to somebody testify and, and you don't believe them or something is going or something that's really horrific. And as an arbiter, as a judge that sits up there, I must be impartial. So to maintain a face of impartiality sometimes can be very difficult. I said, that's the mm -hmm. hardest part. Yeah. Can you talk about the process for, for running for Supreme Court? You know, mm -hmm. what exactly do you have to be doing right now in order to do that? 
So even though they prepared me for this, I don't think I was prepared for this. Pennsylvania has 67 counties. So what I am doing is I am running around to 67 counties trying to meet as many people as possible. If I'm going to ask for somebody's vote, they have to know who I am. I want to meet as many people as I can. I want to look them in the eye and I want them to know who I am. And I want to know who they are. And I want to understand what's going on in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And what's what what's really up in the Elk County beside Elk? You know, I, I want to know these things. <laughs> and I want to know what their issues are. There are businesses yeah. that are struggling all over this state. And it's not that I'm going to fix those issues, but I can at least understand the people that come from those areas. So I am out. I am working my job at the same time, uh, but I'm trying to get out as much as I can and meet as many people as I can. There is a primary, which is in May, and I do have a primary opponent, although I'm the endorsed candidate. Um, somebody chose to stay in the race, and we are going to have a primary in May, and then after that, I hope to get through that primary, and then I'll have an opponent in the fall. Um, so there are two elections coming up. Yeah, it's it's exciting. I I, I'm curious if you're being out and about like that. That's such a great, that's almost a gift to be able to, to go out and be with people from all different parts of the state. What are they saying? What would you, what's the first thing that you would say is a commonality among the feedback from all of these people? So, so you hit a couple things on the head. You, you're so right about this. It is a gift and not everybody looks at it that way, but I certainly do. The ability to get to places I would never have been. Erie, Pennsylvania, I had never been before. And it's a beautiful part of our state. It's far, but it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, and I think the commonality, what I'm finding is most people, they want judges who are fair and who follow the law. It's that simple. They want judges to keep politics out of their decisions and follow the law. And that's a very easy ask on my part because that's what I do every day in my job now. I'm fair, I'm impartial, and I follow the law even if I sometimes don't like the law because it's not my job to change the law or to write the law. That's a separate branch of government. My job is to follow the law. Yeah. Um, do you have a, a daily mantra? So when it's a stressful day and everything goes awry and not as was planned mm. in your book, what what do you say to yourself in your head that brings you back to, you know, a grounded place? I think just to stay focused. Um, I do. I, I love to exercise and I try to get that in because I think that helps keep me centered. I also read a lot, not necessarily law books. I try to get away from that. And I think that those things able and my family, of course, but they are the things that keep me centered and keep me grounded and keep me knowing that, look, you just do the best you can do. And the rest doesn't matter. I'm always going to do the best that I can do. I always do what's right. And if it's not good enough, then I can't do more than that. Right. Yeah. Um, how about a, um, a person? I love this question I, because I think we all have someone like this. If you could sit and have dinner with someone, anyone in the world, who's the first to come to mind? <laughs> You know, other than family, I, I think reaching back into some family would be the first to come to mind. I, I would love to sit down with my grandfather and my uncle, frankly, um, who died too soon. I'd love to hear their mm -hmm. stories. I want to know what really occurred when they came over um, from Italy and, and settled in Norristown, Pennsylvania. I want to know yeah. why they ended up here. I want to know what life was really like for them. That's what I want to learn from them in that respect. I know there's a lot of famous people I could name, but my heart is with my family. So I oh, think I love that, that. someone from a very, a future generation, how cool would that be? Yeah, that's, oh, I love that idea. Yeah. I'm like my, 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 grand, my great grandchildren, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I love the ancestry and I'm starting to dig a little bit in and it's all Irish. There's nothing but Irish. Um, so you have the combination of, of half Irish, half Italian, right? I do. It's and, hard to believe with Tornetta Carluccio. People right. tend not to believe. But my uncle, Joe, who is the one that inspired me, he's Smythe. That's my mother's maiden name, S-M-Y-T-H. S-M-Y-T-H. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, I've not heard that name before. Mm hmm have you been to both Italy and Ireland to kind of? I'm embarrassed to tell you I have not been to Ireland. I've been to Italy oh. loads of times and I would okay. go back every single time. And we yeah. actually went back with my dad and all the kids. We went back to Shaka, which is a small town in Italy, where in Sicily, where my grandparents were from. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that was unbelievable. And I'd go every time. But Ireland is on my list. I think after this election, mm -hmm. it may be something that I'm going to do. 
when things slow down a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, I want to get back to your role as a mom and having your three boys. And tell me what what worries you most for them living in the, you know, we talk a lot on the show about the fast pace of everything in, in yeah. the world because of technology and social mm -hmm. media, et cetera. Um, what do you worry about for them? Like what keeps you up at night when you're thinking about your boys? So it's funny. I'm not a warrior. I never was a warrior raising them. You don't I seem to, I can tell no, you're not a warrior. Yeah. Not at all. I was a single mom with two of my kids for quite a few years. Um, and that was a really hard time in my life. I will tell you, I learned a lot through that time. Um, and then I had my third son when I got remarried. My husband, time is incredibly supportive. Um, and all three boys are, they're, 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 turning into be lovely men. I mean, that sounds like a strange thing, but they're, they're really good at their core. Um, I worry, I worry about a lot of things now that I never worried about before. I think sometimes when they get bigger and older, you tend to worry more. Um, I believe pressure, yeah. bigger, bigger problems, right? When they're little, little problems, when they're bigger, bigger problems. Uh, my middle son, my young, my first is getting married uh, four days after the primary at my house. So it's a little crazy time. Oh my but gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Why not throw a wedding in the mix of everything? What do they say? Give a busy person work and it'll get done quicker. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't need to press that too much more. But um, I worry about his kids. I worry about what yeah. kind of world they're going to be raised in. Yeah. Um, I know my boys are at a stage where I think they're going to be fine, but I worry about their kids. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying very hard to help guide us into a position. Um, you know, let me take a step back. When I talked about running for the Supreme Court, uh, and it was something that people raised to me, not something I ever had on my radar. And you sometimes think about, you know, there's problems on the Supreme Court, and there have been it throughout the years. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court has had their share of issues and trauma and scandal. And I thought about that, and I think, who would want to be a part of that? But the reality is that we're working to make it better, um, and I, I can't complain about anything unless I'm willing to be a source of trying to make it better. And that's what I'm trying to do. Um, so how do you do that? Because the, at the, at the heart of the problems and issues are the people, right? So how do we get people to do the right thing? How do we get people to be empathetic, to be fair? You know, in, in, in by example is all yeah. I can say, you know, <laughs> if I live my life in a way that I believe is empathetic and fair and kind and good. I hope that those working with me, and I know I have an amazing staff here and you know, that I work with in Montgomery County in the courthouse, and they are all just like me. I mean, we all are so similar. And I don't know, I, don't, I can't tell you I influence them, but I think that we gravitate together um, and we work so well together and we truly look at each other like family. And I think that the more that we can spread that. I'm sure where you work so that people love to be with you and they love the passion and, and the interests that you have. You're, you're, you're inquisitive and you're always trying to learn. And I think that's fabulous. And something tells me that people that work with you are the same way. Yeah. yeah. It, it does make a difference to have people that are excited about what, what you're doing. But I, I wanted to ask about your leadership style. You know, what kind of a leader are you? How do you motivate your team? So I've been lucky to have a lot of leadership roles. Um, I was the first woman chief public defender where I, I had an office of 35 attorneys. I was the um, the first judge who was ever president of our 2000 member bar association. I'm going to be the president of the state trial judges come July. And, in all, and also I was president judge here of 24 judges in an entire court system. Um, I find that I do try to lead by example. I'm, I'm a hard worker, um, I'm ethical, and I always try to do the right thing. And I figure out every problem there is. And if I am doing that, then the people that follow in my footsteps, I like to think are doing the same thing. I can be the nicest person in the world if you're doing your job. If you're not doing your job, then we've got an issue. And I'm not afraid to address it head on. Um, I'm not a wallflower. I'm going to deal with the issues head on. And you have to be aware of that. I, I've been accused of sentencing a criminal defendant to jail for the rest of his life. And he's walked out of the courtroom and said, she was really nice. She was really nice. What just happened? Um, wow. that, that was a joke for a while um, because wow. I am empathetic. I'm kind, but I also know that you've got to do certain things. And that's my job and that's my obligation. And that's how I lead. That's, you know, Judge, that's an incredible quality. That conviction, again, I keep coming back. I, I think about that word when I think about you. And I think it's hard for young women today um, 
to have that same conviction. And so how, you know, my, my last question for you really is how do you develop that? How do you quiet the noise and stay with what you know to be true? I think a lot of it is self-confidence. You, you just have to say, this is, if you truly believe in what you're doing, then you're able to do it regardless of what's going on around you. And that's what you want to teach the young people. Because there's a lot of noise right now. And sometimes they're afraid to voice their opinions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're afraid to say, you know what? I may not agree with that. And I believe in this. Uh, and you just have to stick with your gut. Listen, always give other people the ability to try to explain why they think that you're wrong. But if you believe in your heart of hearts that you're doing the right thing, you follow that. Yeah. It's hard sometimes to not, yeah. be, you know, to be distracted by, you know, right. uh, opinions of others. But I think mm -hmm. and we do get more confident with age. That's for sure. I think you're right. I hate yeah. to say I think age yeah. has a lot to do with it. <laughs> not that we're admitting anything here. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, I so much appreciate having you on the show and for you taking the time. Um, I'm so impressed by you and the work that you're doing. And I wish you the very best of luck with your race. Um, and so this has been great. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm glad. Thank you. Um, so up next is uh, Sherry Marson for our Lifestyle Watch segment, and she'll be talking to Chef Amy Edelman of the Night Kitchen here in Philadelphia. Hmm. Stay with us, and we'll be back. Action News celebrating 50 years of AccuWeather. If you think severe weather has been on the rise, you are correct. In the last three years, tornado warnings in our region have shattered records. With 52 last year alone, half of those warnings resulted in confirmed tornadoes, including two extremely rare EF3s. Thanks for always trusting us to keep you informed. 50 Years of AccuWeather is sponsored by Independence Blue Cross. Choose coverage you can count on with the region's strongest network. Is the best vacation one that you find? or when you get lost in. One that takes you to new heights or reminds you to go with the flow. To get your feet wet and your wheels spinning. One that lets you find your own rhythm or get carried away. Find the best of yourself. Get lost in the woods. Plan your stay in the wild woods today. From Philadelphia to the Lehigh Valley and everywhere in between. For 150 years, Penn Community Bank has been a part of your neighborhood. Helping businesses start, supporting families as they grow, and staying connected to the people and places that make this region special. It's who we are and where we're from. Penn Community Bank, here we are and here we grow. There's a moment every hour, every day, every week. These moments shape our world. They add color, perspective, and sometimes pain. Moments are meant to be shared, shared by friends, family, people you trust. At Action News, we cherish every moment, and it's our profound responsibility to bring you closer to your world. Never miss a moment. Trust the people at Action News. Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. And the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amount of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hello, and welcome to the lifestyle segment of Women to Watch. I'm Sherry Morrison. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Chef Amy Edelman, chef and owner of the Night Kitchen Bakery and Cafe. Welcome to the show, Amy. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's our pleasure. Amy, uh, before we get into all of the stories about your wonderful baked goods, if you could please tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. So... I grew up in the Mount Airy section of Philadelphia, near our bakery, the Night Kitchen Bakery, which is in Chestnut Hill. And I went to the Philadelphia High School for Girls. After that, I was on a one-year waiting list to get into the Culinary Institute of America, our alma mater, <laughs> and um, went there for two years and traveled around quite a bit after that. What a great school. I, I was there. 
a few years before you, I think six or seven. And um, I absolutely loved it. So after you graduated from CIA, also known as the Culinary Institute of America, you moved around and spent some time in Florida, New York, and you're at Disney. And then you'd headed back to the Philadelphia area. What brought you back to Philly? I think I had a better appreciation of Philadelphia after I traveled around a bit and traveled around the world a bit, saw other neighborhoods and lived in other places. I also missed my family. My mom lived here. I had a lot of friends here. So after traveling around for about seven years, I returned to Philadelphia and haven't left. I understand completely. I think I've been here forever. It's a tough place to leave. Um, and it seems like the relationships that you build over your lifetime are are pretty strong. Um, and I don't know that it's just a Philly thing or if it's all over the country, but to me, it seems like a Philly thing. Um, you worked in a number of some of Philly's favorite restaurants. Who in, who inspired you over the years? Who was who do you think really like pushed you into this business that you're in? Uh, well, when I was in high school, I worked for uh, friends of the family who had a little restaurant in Chestnut Hill called The Spice Shop. And um, I started out as a bus girl, but they allowed me to work in the kitchen one summer. And I took to it. I loved it. My grandmother did a lot of cooking. My mother always cooked from scratch. I always thought that everyone's parents cooked from scratch and that they had home cooked meals every night. But apparently that wasn't the case. But um, I love that experience working in the kitchen at the spice shop and that's when i decided to apply for the culinary institute of america yeah and then you started your own catering business culinary creations and the crefeld a private school in chestnut hill made you an offer you couldn't refuse what what did you do with them right so when i came back from france i um came back to the area near near my mom and um got a restaurant job and after about three years of that job at Polaroso Restaurant, mm -hmm. I was given the opportunity to uh, use a kitchen at the Krefeld School, which is a small private school in Chestnut Hill. And as long as I provided lunches for the kids in the school, I was able to use their kitchen for my catering business. So it was an excellent opportunity that I couldn't pass up. And I ran that business for about five years. Yeah, I had a very similar situation. Our paths, when, when we were going through our stories and, and the path that we've taken, we've had a lot of very similar experiences, which is was really nice for me and I'm sure nice for you that, you know, people are so willing to help new business owners start out. Um, so after you had the culinary creations, you decided to sell that to your partner. And in 2000, you purchased the Night Kitchen, which was just a bakery at a time. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, the Night Kitchen Bakery was just a tiny little place with a really strong customer base. And it had been here for 15 years. The original owners were two women who made recipes from Gourmet Magazine. And so when I purchased the bakery from them in 2000, I was buying the recipes and the reputation and the really strong customer base. That was that was a, a nice thing to purchase and what a great neighborhood. So there were some new trends with baking um, with fondant, especially a few years back. What sets the Night Kitchen Bakery apart from all of those or most bakeries that you see anywhere? So when I bought the bakery in 2000, they had a very small repertoire of cakes and um, other things sweets like bars and cookies and tarts and we increased the repertoire we increased the number of cakes and selection that we had and we also started working with fondant icing which back in 2000 no one really knew about ace of cakes had just started on tv food network so people were beginning to understand what was happening in the pastry world and the cake decorating world but it was after that that we started introducing that to our customers and after Ace of Cakes on TV Food Network came the Cake Boss and the popularity of fondant and custom cakes really grew to the point where we were able to expand the bakery. Yeah, it's, it's amazing what you can do with the fondant. And we'll get to that in, in a minute. Um, is the cafe that you added just baked goods and beverages or do you offer other food items? Um, so about 10 years after owning the bakery, um, my husband and I decided to expand the business 
he was baking with us and came on full time after a couple of years of my owning the bakery by myself. And we decided to expand into the other half of the twin building and add a cafe with some tables out front. And we began making soups, sandwiches, salads, quiche. So we offered that as well as all of the pastry items that we had previously. Uh, and I've seen and tasted quite a few of your food items and your cakes and baked goods. They've all been outstanding. You were named Best of Philly for your double fudge brownies and Wedding Wire for your cakes and a winner in the Let Them Eat Cake competition for the best design and best tasting cake. You are very well known for your specialty cakes. What are your top varieties? So for the cakes that people come in to the bakery for every single day, we have three favorites. One is our mocha chocolate cake, which is like a devil's food cake. It's very much chocolate is the predominant flavor. It's very moist. The second most popular cake is my personal favorite, which I always joke that it was the reason I bought the bakery. It's, it's a yellow cake with lemon curd and cream cheese frosting. My mother got it for me for my 30th birthday before I bought the bakery. I <laughs> thought about that cake all the time. And the third most popular is the carrot cake, which is also covered in cream cheese frosting and it's super moist. But we're also really well known for the custom cakes that we make using the fondant icing. <laughs> so funny because I just helped with an event um, a baby shower and uh, they had all three of those cakes. So it's really yeah. funny that they picked the three top favorites and they were delicious. I tried each and every one of them. <laughs> Please tell us a little bit about your menu and some of your specialties. I know the gluten-free market is huge right now and has been for a number of years. Do you have or create any dietary specialties like a gluten-free baked goods and, and what's the most popular, do you think? We do have um, a, quite a number of gluten-free items. We make a couple of cookies with almond flour and coconut, uh, a coconut macaroon. We also make a gluten-free flourless chocolate cake, which is extremely popular with people who love chocolate, whether they're gluten-free or not, or flour intolerant or not. We also make some savory items that are vegetarian and occasionally a vegan item as well for our savory foods, like a soup or a sandwich. Well, you you threw all of these wonderful items. You've met some very exciting people and designed some fabulous cakes for big events. A few of these have some um, great examples of what you can do with fondant. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the most creative, exciting, and memorable cakes and experiences you've had. So we recently created a cake that was a standing football cake for um, Angelo Cataldi, who just retired from WIP Sports Radio. And before that, we created cakes for Patti LaBelle. We were commissioned by Adam Sandler's wife to make a carrot cake for him for his 55th birthday when he was filming in Philadelphia a couple of years ago. And my very favorite cake was a cake that we were commissioned to make by Steve Luthither's um, chef. He wanted a cake that was in the shape of a guitar, his guitar. And the chef, uh, the cake that Chef Jackie created was the exact replica of his guitar. And we, my husband and I delivered the cake to the Met and presented the cake to Steve, who is the founding member of Toto. And he was so excited when he saw the cake. He hugged both of us. And then they asked us to stay and sing happy birthday to him on stage with the pre-show crowd. And that was one of the most fun and exciting moments I've ever had at the night kitchen. Oh, I bet. That gives me chills. And and I saw the video. He just looked so excited about it. And he couldn't stop taking a video of the as of the cake as he was looking at it. Um, and you've over the years, aside from the cakes and the bakery and your business, you've done a lot of work to your business to become more sustainable and help serve the community in the very best way. What are some of the things that you've done and enjoyed doing for the community? Um, so whenever we have the opportunity to give back to the community, uh, we do. So, for example, I sit on the board of the Chestnut Hill Business Association and the Business Improvement District, also the Green Initiative Committee, in which we look for areas in Chestnut Hill that we can add trees to the tree canopy 
and also um, identify spaces that we can green and create little pocket parks. Uh, being a part of the community is is huge, and and I know that you do a great job because that's actually how I initially heard about you was through the Chestnut Hill Grapevine. So you you do wonderful work. Um, we I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you for sharing your story and your culinary talents. Hope you'll come back and join us sometime again. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Sure. For more information about Chef Amy and the Night Kitchen Bakery and Cafe, their menus, placing orders, and specialties to go, go to www.nightkitchenbakery.com or stop in. They're open seven days. Thank you again. Sue will be right back to close out the show. Ladies, keep living your dreams. The number one news at 10 p.m. Action news on PHL 17. Join Shari Williams, Gray Hall, Deuces Rogers, and meteorologist Adam Joseph for all the big stories at a time that's right for you. Action news at 10 p.m. on PHL 17. Hi, this is Sue Rocco. Women to Watch is pleased to share a clip from Breaking Through, a podcast hosted by Madeline Bell, the president and CEO of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This interview is part of a series in which Madeline interviews CHOP's women scientists about what inspires them and advice they have for other women interested in pursuing science and medicine careers. My guest today is Dr. Susan Firth. In 2021, Dr. Firth was named CHOP's chief scientific officer she is the first woman in CHOP's 166-year history to hold this important role. I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Firth to Breaking Through. So Sue, it's really great to be talking with you today, and it's a topic that I'm very interested in, which is the future of CHOP and science and research and discoveries. But let me say that you are now our chief scientific officer, so how exciting from that girl with the chemistry set yeah. to the woman who is now the leader of our scientific community here at CHOP. And tell me, you've been in the role now for about six months, and tell me a little bit about what your impressions are, what excites you about the role, and what do you see for the next several years? It's a really exciting place to be and an exciting time in science. Since I've been at CHOP now for about 11 years, and with the talent that we have here, our sense of mission with research as our North Star, I think we have the opportunity to transform the medical care we deliver to children. To hear more of Madeline's interviews with CHOP's amazing doctors and scientists, listen to Breaking Through with Madeline Bell, available wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for being with me for another week of Women to Watch. And stay tuned next week for my interview with Colleen Bashar. Colleen is a Senior Vice President for Guidewire. Thank you so much to Katiri for producing the show and always to our partners, our watch team partners, corporate partners and sponsors for helping us to bring you the show every week. Have a great week, everyone. At Action News, we cherish every moment. And it's our profound responsibility to bring you closer to your world. Never miss a moment. Trust the people at Action News. Now, the women to watch, military watch. Fewer than half of eligible veterans use the VA health benefits they are entitled to. But those who do use the VA, more than 80% of veterans are satisfied with the VA care. Hi, I'm Carol Eggert, Senior Vice President of Military Affairs at Comcast NBC Universal. Now, you may be asking, why should this matter to me? I share this with you because most of our listeners have some connection to the veterans in their community and may have the opportunity to share information about this new VA benefit. The VA has just launched the PACT Act, which is the Promise to Address Comprehensive Toxics, which is the most significant expansion of veteran benefits and care in more than three decades empowering the VA to help millions of toxic exposed veterans and their survivors. The PACT Act expands VA health care and benefits for veterans exposed to burn pits, Agent Orange, and many other toxic substances. The PACT Act adds to the list of health conditions that the VA presumes are caused by exposure to these substances. 
This law helps the VA provide generations of veterans and their survivors with the care and benefits they've earned and deserve. The PACT Act is the least we can do for the countless men and women who suffered toxic exposure while serving their country, said President Biden during the PACT Act bill signing ceremony. It means access to life insurance, home loan insurance, tuition benefits, and help with health care. So what can you do? Simply refer those veterans you know to va.gov and tell them to search the PACT Act to learn more. It's in